Today we're running down our top five games to bring out when hosting groups. And to help me run through this list... Hi everyone, I'm Brittany. And I'm Mark Maya. Welcome, Welcome to, to Board, Board Game, Game Coffee. Coffee. So today we'd like to go over the top five games that we like to bring out when we are hosting groups of people. Now, normally that group consists of mostly couples, but we do get the odd single that sneaks in there every once in a while. Or family members that we want to play with as well. Now, this group is not necessarily made up of hardcore gamers. We do have a lot of newer players. And we want to make everyone feel comfortable, so we try to be really strategic on the games that we bring out to make everyone feel like they can play the game and enjoy it. Now, our number five game is a game that we don't see a lot of other people play often or even actually talk about. As far as I'm concerned, we're the only people that play it. <laughs> but it's such a fun game. It is fun. And... It's designed by Richard Garfield. Now, for those of you that don't know, Richard Garfield is the designer of Magic the Gathering, which is a huge, complex, and amazing, super popular card game. Competitive card game. So let's find out what number five is. Ghost. Now, Ghost is kind of like, how do I like to describe this? It's like advanced crazy eights. And I know what you're thinking, oh, that's a kid's game. Well, it is. You can play this with kids yeah, completely. Which is fun. It's easy enough for kids to pick up. But it's also fun for a group of aggressive adults. Yes. It's a really good introductory card game for people who are just getting into board games or card games. So Goose is a two to six player game, which is why we really like to play with my family. Yeah, because six is the perfect number. That covers me, Brit, mom, dad, grandma, brother. I need another finger. Now the premise of Ghost is that everybody has a mansion full of ghosts that they need to empty before the other players. Now the mansion is just a deck of cards. So everybody gets their own deck and they have to run through that and the first one to get rid of all their cards wins. Now if you look at the rules, I believe it says something like the last player to empty their mansion loses. But as we mentioned in our last video, we're a competitive household. So we'd, we prefer to have one winner. So we've tweaked the rules a bit and just say the first player to empty all the ghosts out of their mansion is the winner. Because really, nobody wants to sit around to see if they're second best. It's true. Now what I like about Goose, even though you might say it's geared toward children, our games have gotten pretty heated. So we've got basically six people around the table yelling and pointing that somebody's almost done their mansion. And then everybody gangs up on that one person as much as possible. Basically it turns into a game of get them. Usually that person is me and I get ganged up on because I'm awesome. And I get through my deck really fast. She tries to get through her deck really fast. And then everything turns on me. Yeah. And that's her family. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> Should we share what our number four is? Before we do, before we move on to our number four, one thing I'd like to mention, a side note if you will, is every time I've played this game, even the people who have introduced me to this game, has always referred to this as Goost. And so have we. It's caught on. That's what we used in the video. Goost. But personally, when I looked at this the first time, you know what I see? I don't see Goost. I see Ghost. I'm pretty sure that's what it was intended to be. I mean, look, it's, it looks all ghosty. The next game we're bringing out is a little more advanced than Goose, but still easy to learn. Mysterium, which is a two to seven player game. Now in Mysterium, one player takes on the role of a ghost who's been murdered, and the other players take on the role of psychics who are trying to uncover that murder. So it's a cooperative game where everybody's playing together to figure out who the murderer is. The catch is, the ghost is actually not allowed to speak to the psychics. So how they're communicating, whoever plays the ghost, how they're communicating is actually through a lot of abstract art, which comes through in cards. The psychics, their job is to figure out who, this is. This part's very clueish. They're trying to figure out who the murderer is, where the murder happened, and which weapon they actually killed the ghost with. Mysterium is great for when you're hosting people that might not know each other or not know each other that well. So it allows for a lot of communication between the players because we all have the same common goal of trying to find the murderer. And the great thing about this is since me and Brittany have both played this extensively that it's easy to introduce people and you don't have to run through like 45 minutes of rules before they start playing. You can just set it up, give them their cards, and kind of just talk them through the process as you're playing. A nice little feature about this game as well is they actually have music that gets you into the mood while you're oh, playing. Right. Which is actually, I think, a nice little added feature. I think it's on their 
on their website or on YouTube? It's somewhere. If you you look can definitely up, find it on YouTube. Yeah, so you can find it. And there's, there's a Mysterium soundtrack that will accompany this, which is really neat. We'll actually post the link to the music in the description below. That's a good idea. All right, so now let's move on to our number three. All right, now our number three game on the list is actually a, another who done it can't speaky guessy guess game. So if you like murder mysteries, this one might be for you too. Deception, murder in Hong Kong. Now, Deception, murder in Hong Kong plays four to 12 players, which is, it's a lot of players. Now, just like Mysterium, uh, except there's no ghosts, these dead people do talk from the grave. I guess there's no psychics. You know, if we actually got the psychics from Mysterium into Deception Hong Kong, they might solve this case a little faster. In Deception, one player takes on the role of the forensic scientist, and instead of trying to give out clues with uh, colored pictures, they're trying to give out clues with uh, keywords on cards. Yeah. So every individual who's playing this game will actually have possible murder weapons in front of them and clues, and only one person is the guilty player. Yeah, and that's another thing different than Mysterium is, although it's cooperative, there is one player amongst the group which is the murderer. And as the forensic scientist, let's say it's me, it's my job to guide you toward that murderer, while it's their job to try to throw off the case. Now, although I know who it is, I can't do anything obvious like look at their cards or hint. That's no fun. Now, in Deception, there are additional characters you can include, but now, personally, I find it better to include these additional characters between 8 to 12 players. Now, the extra characters you can add are an accomplice that works with the murderer and a witness. Now, the accomplice's job is to just help the murderer throw off, uh, throw off the case, because I still, as a forensic scientist, would have to point everybody toward the murderer, not the accomplice. The witness in this game actually knows who the accomplice is and the murderer. And it's really neat because they actually try to help the other investigators or lead them into the right direction. But they don't but, know who's who. That's right. They don't know who's who. Yeah, because all they know is these two people. One of them is the murderer, one of them is the accomplice. But the witness has to be really careful because their job is to help the other investigators. If they help too much and the accomplice and the murderer finds out who the witness is, they have the opportunity to kill the witness at the end of the game and steal the win. This game is really easy to teach, it's easy to learn, and you can play with a lot of people at a party. And my favorite part about this game is the distrust that builds between oh. people. Yes. But that's nothing compared to our number one, which we will get to later. For now, let's find out what our number two is. So our number two is a well-known game about guessing things. Code names. It plays four to eight players competitively. And it's got a two to eight player cooperative mode. We don't know what that is. Like I said, here at Board Game Coffee, we are competitive people. Now, Codenames gameplay is interesting because it takes the group you're hosting and it splits them in half, pitting them against each other. Now, how this works is there's a 5x5 five five grid of cards on the table, and my job as the spy master is to help my team guess the words that they have to find before the other team does. As a spy master, you have to be really careful not to give things away. So you definitely don't want to just stare at a card really, really hard and hope that the people on your team will look at that card. Yeah, because there are a lot of ways to cheat, even if you're not doing it on purpose. Yeah. It's just these like natural human things you do when you're playing. So you, as the spy master, you have a lot of responsibility not to screw the game up. It's a lot of pressure. Everybody we've introduced this game to loves it. So yeah, if you get the opportunity to go out there and pick up code names, you won't be disappointed. So let's find out what our number one is. What could it be? Now our number one game isn't just my number one for this category. It's actually one of my favorite games of all time. And it get a little intense, but well, let's just get to it. So our number one game is... Dead of Winter. It's a two to five player game and it's a little more mature, so it's probably not for the little ones at home. Yeah, and Dead of Winter is a little more complicated game. It's one of those games where there's a lot of explaining up front, mm -hmm. but when you really get into it, it's not that complicated. There's just a lot of little things to know before you get into it, just so you know what you can do. 
So this game is probably more for the advanced player that's played board games or tabletop games in the past. But we have had nights where we've taught this game to completely new players mm -hmm. and they've caught on just fine. Mm -hmm. It's just I find the explanation takes on for like takes forever. It's like 30 to 45 minutes to explain every little thing. But if you've watched our how to plays, I can get very descriptive. So in Dead of Winter, all the players take on the roles of survivors in this winter zombie apocalypse that's going on. And you have to work together to, um, to survive this apocalypse. I really like Dead of Winter for the one mechanic that it's both competitive and cooperative. So everyone has their secret agenda, but at the same time, everyone has to work towards the same goal of keeping everyone alive. Because if you don't, then everyone dies. And it doesn't matter if you're winning your secret agenda because you're dead. The best part of Dead of Winter, if you ask me, is there's a betrayer mechanic in it. And I love the betrayer mechanic. And the best thing about it is, unlike other betrayer games, there might not be a betrayer at all. But just because there's a chance of it being in there... Everyone's on edge. Everybody's on edge. <laughs> Nobody trusts anybody. And what really brings that to light is the, the fact that everybody, as Brittany mentioned, has their own secret agenda. So everybody's up to something. Yeah. But because they're doing their sneaky things and they might not be helping you in the moment when you need it, you're like, traitor! Now, as you play through Dead of Winter, you lose morale for a bunch of things. Not keeping your colony clean. If um, survivors die, that all loses morale. If your morale reaches zero, you lose. There's also a turn tracker, so you only have a certain amount of turns to complete any specific mission. The crossroad cards in this game are a lot of fun because they're kind of like the story cards that could be either triggered by an event or not. So as we mentioned, the basic premise of this game is everybody works together to gather supplies they need to survive the night and they continue doing this until they reach their ultimate goal, whatever that may be. And the whole time, they nobody trusts each other because there might be a betrayer among them. People can get seriously angry in this game. There is still a game that Mark and I played, what, like three months ago, that it's still like when I think about it, I get so angry because you totally deceived me. You were the betrayer. As the betrayer, it is your job to betray. And the whole time, I was not doing my side mission because we were either gonna die no. or I had to play Hold my card. Hold on. Brittany was doing some suspicious... Okay, I knew she wasn't the betrayer. Because but, you were the betrayer. But her behavior was suspicious. Because I wanted to win my side mission. But if you don't help the group, Brittany, everybody loses. And then he was the character card, which was the dog. Barky the dog. That so, was my main character. Who is the cutest dog ever. And he killed the dog. And I was sad because the dog died. Like, I actually felt for you in that moment. To find out that was the whole agenda the whole time was to break down morale. Whoa, 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 whoa. I did not, the, killing the dog was not my agenda. That was just the bonus. So what do I like most about Dead of Winter is that conflict. That the chance that there's a betrayer and there might not be a betrayer. But just that idea that there might be throws so much conflict on the people, table. And people are yelling and it's tense. And you're like, why are you doing this? I don't trust you. I don't trust this. But I got to help. And you're trying to help. And you're surviving. There's zombies. Uh. Oh my god, it's so it, it's good. It's so intense. It brings people together and it tears them apart all in the same game. And this is a game that at the beginning players will be like, it's complicated, I don't get it. Yeah. But when cool. once they start playing it, they're like, oh I get it. I just have to move over there, roll the dice, see if I got attacked or not. Draw this card, fight some zombies. It is really simple to get into. There's just so much affront to teach. Mm -hmm. So if you do have if you do host a game, make sure you have enough time to go over the rules. Like I'd say give yourself a good hour for setup and teaching. Okay, so that was our top five games to bring out when hosting. We hope you really like them. We would love to hear what are you playing when you have guests over or what are your top five? So that's our top five games that we like to pull out when we're hosting a game night at the Board Game Coffee household. So thanks for joining us. And if you like this video and you'd like to see more, we put them out every week, subscribe here. And if you want to see more of our videos right now, click here. So thanks for watching. I'm Brittany. And I'm Mark Maya. And, and this, this is, is Board Game, Game Coffee. Coffee. And remember, have fun, keep gaming, and be, be social. social. See you next week.